Hey, so how's it going? Gun Psychiatrist here, and in today's video, I'm gonna walk you through the installation steps that I use to install shim kits onto an AR-15 or AR-10 upper and lower receiver. What these shim kits do is they remove any left and right play that you can have between the upper and lower receivers. This play can lead to degraded accuracy, and it can also lead to erratic groups, a multitude of other things. Now, the upper tension set screw is the first step in removing this, but really the upper tension set screw just acts as a shelf. Now, if you have the money to obtain a custom machined upper lower receiver set that is machined to specific tolerances, those uppers and lowers are gonna have no play between each other. But most people are building their lowers and uppers from pieces. So they're buying the upper, they're buying the lower. And one thing that we have to recognize is there is a lot of tolerance that's allotted to the upper and lower. That way they will all fit. What does happen though, is you get a wiggle in there. Removing the left and right slop with an upper tension set screw or a uh, AccuWedge or some of the various other things that have been made out there will have a tendency to remove that, but you gotta think when the firearm is actually fired, that's when it can start to come off target and bounce around back in there, thus throwing all your hard spent time and ammunition and money off target, especially if you're sighting in optics or you're really shooting for precision groups at longer ranges. So what these shims are designed to do is to prevent any lateral movement or really remove most of it. So when your gun fires, the upper and lower receivers stay within the same position of each other after firing each time. And you get repetitious results every time you pull the trigger. Let's show you what I mean. So let's take this AR-10 for example. When we put the upper and lower together, we can actually physically hear and see the movement between both tangs, which are these, on the upper into the lower. Now, why does this happen? Well, if you take an upper and try to put it on any AR-10 lower, you could have fitment issues unless these two pieces were machined exactly together to very tight tolerances. So you're gonna get this wiggle. Now, sure, I can jam a upper tension set screw in here and possibly take that away but each time it fires with the force of the recoil and the components working through this firearm, it can have a tendency to jolt it back and forth. So what my shim kits are designed to do is to remove this play and wiggle. This isn't gonna be an issue for you. So today I'm gonna to show you how to install these in the best methods to use in the equipment you'll need. It's very, very simple. So these are some of the items that you're gonna to need to get started installing the shim kits. The most important key here to have is a set of calipers. If you do not have a set of calipers, using little pieces of printer paper chopped up can work just as effective. This is gonna be the most precise way to measure, but this works as well. You're also gonna need a cotton ball with some rubbing alcohol. You're gonna need some five minute epoxy. The brand does not matter. You're also gonna need a pen and some scratch paper. And if you're terrible at math like me, you're probably gonna to wanna to have a calculator on hand. We're gonna be doing what seems to be basic subtraction, but there's gonna be a lot of numbers on the end and a calculator will just help speed up the process. So to begin this whole measurement process, the first thing that we need to do is we need to take some measurements. The most accurate way to make your measurements is gonna be with a pair of calipers, whether digital or manual. We'll go ahead and start with the biggest measurements that are gonna be first, which is always gonna come from your lower, your upper receiver is gonna have the smaller tolerances on the tanks. So what we're doing is we're wanting to measure in these rear tang areas. And as you can see, we'll take our first measurement from the rear. And we'd just like to center these right over the holes. And take a few measurements each time. And after about three or four times, go with the most repeatable number. And this one on the lower, I'm getting 0.5085. So we'll move to the front. Front, I'm getting 0 0.7600. Then let's move to the rear. 0 0.7480. And then for the front, we're getting exactly a half inch. 
Alternatively, if you don't have calipers, one easier way to do this is going to be with shards of paper. So we can simply take pieces of paper. I start with two. Set them on each side. Like this. And try to seat the lower on there. If that's too much, remove a piece and we'll move back to one each. And once you can seat the lower, you can actually see with the paper in place that there is no play in the front. So on this number, for the front of the lower, we write two each. And let's do the same thing for the rear. It's like one. And that's really tight. So we can do 0.75 or one. So the paper trick is obviously faster, but it's not gonna be as precise. So the numbers that we've come up with and determined are that the rear portion of the lower is gonna require two four thousandths of an inch shims and the front will require two six thousandths of an inch shims as well. Now, it's fair to note that using the paper method, the paper method I was determined that the rear needed only two three thousandths of an inch shims, whereas the front only needed two four thousandths of an inch shims. And there you can see how much more accurate the calipers can get you, but it's always good to leave a little bit room for play. Why do I say this? Well, you don't want to get it so tight that it actually could damage the shim or just won't go back down in there. So you could take off a thousandth of an inch just to help with fitment. Either way, you're going to be removing most of this play in there. And you've got to think you're going to epoxy it too, and you have to account for the epoxy. So sometimes maybe using the paper method would be good, but it's always good to leave a little extra. And if you're coming up with numbers like 425 hundred thousandths, well, you can pretty much leave that hundred thousand cent off and just call it four thou. Or you can drop it a thou and call it three thou. And I still think that you'll be fine because we do have to account for the small, tiny layer of epoxy we're going to put in there. Now for the AR-10, the smallest thickness of a shim that I can get is down to five thousandths of an inch. Now that might present itself a problem with the rear of the lower. And if that's the case, you could sand a little bit out what have you, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a shot and just see how the fit is. Our objective here is to shim each side of the lower because we wanna keep it straight. But honestly, if you can't do that or you get a tight fit with one side, that's fine. As long as there's no wobble in there, I think you're gonna be all right. Because either way, there's enough of tolerance for the bolt to clear the rear of the buffer tube tang where it screws into that you're not gonna have any issues. And honestly, throwing it a couple maybe one, two thou out left or right, isn't gonna be too much of a foul on your, on your gun or on your end. So we're gonna go ahead and prep the lower receiver for installation. Now while we're doing this, it's good to check our work. So we can grab one of these little shims and slightly insert it into place to see if this is gonna fix our problem. Now, as you can see with just one shim, I have zero play in the rear end of this. Now the tolerances on these shims can vary from shim to shim. Honestly, this is supposed to be around 5,007 inch and this one's five. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at shimming one side of this and see how this holds up before we decide to do both. So I like what I have. I don't have any flop, I don't have any slop. So now that we've determined the proper amount of shimming that is gonna be needed for this 
upper and lower receiver. We're gonna go ahead and get ready to install and glue these into place. One thing, if you're only doing one side, the one thing that I am going to recommend is to glue from the areas that, where the access pins are or the takedown pins are. And it's just my preference. I think it's easier to align them. You can push the pins through a little bit and then we can set the upper and lower on top of there, push the pins through and let everything set up. Um, that's just how I prefer to do it. Honestly, if it's the other side, you're just gonna kind of be stuck and you might have to get a little small puncher pick to help guide it if it slips down at all and then just run the pin through. Don't be afraid about you know epoxying your upper and lower together. Now at the same time, I wouldn't recommend that you just douse epoxy in there. But just you're only going to use this Q-tip to just dab the epoxy on the shim, and that way it'll stay in place. It's a lot easier to get these shims to stay in place if they're on the side where the pins are, because if they do fall off or have an alignment issue, you can always turn it sideways and then kind of work the pin up in there to where you could still get the upper to seat and push the pins through. Make sure you got good clearance. And it might take you a few times, but this process does work. And I like to take a piece of this paper that I had, just dab it over the top and press down really hard so you get a nice good fit. But the longer you wait, sometimes the better because you can let this epoxy set up just a little bit more. And the closer it is to drying, the more propensity it's going to have to want to stick. There we go. Trust me, this little bit of epoxy is not going to stick your lower together. Now, once you have this on, now would be the point in time that I would do any kind of cleanup work of any residual epoxy on the exterior surfaces. And then it's time to insert the lower to the upper. And this can be get a little tricky. Once it's done, check your fit by inserting the pins all the way through and then wait about 10 to 15 minutes, 20 minutes to ensure that the epoxy has cured for the most part, and then we can remove these two pieces from each other. And that's how I install the shim kits that I provide. There might be better ways out there. I haven't really found one yet. I've looked into adhesive back shims, but I'm not sure how well those will stand up, but a good solid five minute epoxy will stand up and has stood up in previous guns that I've owned. Remember that whenever you're doing this, preparation is 90% of the job. So if you try to glue to oil, it's not gonna hold very well. But if you glue to an oil-free surface and bond the two pieces together, it will hold up and stand up. Now, if one comes out from time to time, you just would, you know, re-clean it and re-glue it, and it should stay in place. The best way to get a shim kit is to send me an email at kevin at thegunpsy.com for now until I can have some time to get these up on eBay and, of course, the website as well. Now, if you're having any issues with installation or you need some troubleshooting help, Please don't be afraid to ask. I always love to talk to my customers and followers, and I would love to be of assistance in the event you need it. So I want to say thanks for watching, folks. Hail the Republic. Stand up for our freedoms and rights. The Second Amendment, among many other rights, are under attack right now, and it's pertinent upon all of us Americans to stand up and fight for those rights we wish to retain. Thanks for watching this video, and happy shooting. God bless America.